so um, I'd like to give you a sort of overview of the type of work that, that we do in the group. And um, basically, I am interested in any computational tool that enables us to understand biology. So I tend to work at the molecular level and I tend to do physical models of things. So I tend to represent the DNA molecule with all of its chemistry, or I tend to represent a protein with its mechanical properties. But of course, that's just that that's one way of going about modeling. There's also the sort of informatics and the data analytics and the systems biology. And I'm very interested in that, too. And I'm also interested in ways in which the theoretical biology community, we don't even really have a name or computational biology community, can try and integrate our different tools and expertise more generally so so my big lot my my massive long-term aspiration is to have a sort of holistic model of biology where we can connect together all of the informatics data sets and the omics data sets with the imaging data sets and model it all as one big um you know whole whole life model um so that's the ultimate aspiration but we're a long way from from that so I'll show you my very small contribution to that overall dream. Um, and I really, really like this picture here. So um, this is taken outside the University of Kent. And it's um, obviously a statue of DNA. But the thing about it that's really beautiful, as, as well as the nice lady, is the fact that this is a super coil piece of DNA. So I, I saw it and I was like, oh, I'm delighted for the first time. Here's a really good super, a statue of super coil DNA. And for me, that's very, very important part of the sort of physical modeling versus informatics type modeling and the different contributions that we can get to both, as hopefully you will see. So, um, so we'll start off by, by thinking about, um, about DNA and, and, and genomes. So there are sort of two ways really of looking at DNA and the way in which it stores biological information. And the first is a sort of informatics type way which is where the DNA provides a four-letter chemical code, obviously a very big four-letter chemical code because there are three billion base pairs of humans. And this is where we think about DNA a bit like a sort of passive technology. It's like a book that you could sit there and, and read. And if you could read the book and understand the code, then in principle, you'd be able to, to reconstruct the organism. So another way of looking at DNA, and this is the way that we, well, we use both ways to look at it, but, but my, my collaborators do the informatics and I do the sort of what we call mechanogenomics or physical genomics. So in this view, we actually represent the DNA as an actual molecule. So we represent its chemical structure. And um, in this view, the DNA is like an active participant in its own metabolism. So, so using its own mechanics helps it to regulate the genetic code. So then we're, we're viewing DNA not so much as a, as a book, but more like a computer or a, uh, some sort of computer game that we interact with and um, it affects us and we affect it. So it's so a sort of active technology. And when DNA is packaged in the cell, it has to be, if you're a prokaryote, either packed up and supercoiled and condensed by nuclear associated proteins for, for bacteria, prokaryotes. If you're a eukaryote, of course, it's wrapped around histones and then packed in, into what we call topologically associated domains. And this structure is, is, is very specific at that length scale. And the idea is, is that the packaging of the DNA and the way it's condensed and the presence of these sort of topological, topologically associated domains actually conveys information as well as the chemical code itself. So what we're going to try and understand um, is we, so, so there are some really, really amazingly awesome models of um, physical 
genomics at the sort of whole nucleus level and of cell division and um, and these are generally informed by these um, high C experiments that tell you which part of the chromosome is next to each other. So that's been very, very um, successful. What we're going to try and do is slightly opposite. We're going to build the smallest, most simple example of a piece of DNA that can sustain complex topology. And we're going to then model those systems and understand how the topology changes the DNA structure. So, um, these sorts of very simplified systems are not completely um, biological. So when we started modeling them, it was really a, a, a crazy physicist thinking about, well, what can I actually model and what's easy and what can I understand? Because I'm a physicist and not a biologist. But actually, it turns out that um, small circular DNAs and large circular DNAs are found everywhere in biology. So um, one of my uh, collaborators, um, Masashura, she's been working on what, what she calls extra chromosomal DNAs, ECC DNA, and she detects these in every cell type, but in a cell type specific fashion. So these are tiny little circular bits of DNA and some big ones as well. They can get very, very large. These are bits of circular DNA that have somehow become detached from the chromosome. So, so they're, 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 they've been either excised or, well, we don't know if they get excised or if they get made from other fragments or where they come from as yet. So these sorts of um, really tiny circles, yes, we can model them and that's convenient, but they do also exist biologically as well. Although what their function is, is, is unknown. So what we're going to try and do is we're gonna try and run some molecular dynamic simulations of circular bits of DNA. So molecular dynamic simulations, what it does is it uses classical Newtonian mechanics so that's balls and springs. So we represent all of the atoms as classical balls and all of the bonds between them as classical springs. So this equation here is our um, molecular, what we call our molecular dynamics force field, our, our function that describes everything. So we have bonds, we have angles. We also label every single atom in the system with a van der Waals interaction that describes um, the, the um, van der Waals forces and an electrostatic interaction as well. And once we know the forces on each atom as a result of every other atom in the system, we can then iteratively evolve Newton's equations of motion to get a movie of what the molecule looks like as it changes shape due to thermal fluctuations. Because of course these things are tiny, so they're always changing shape due to thermal fluctuations. And this is critical to understand this, to understand molecular recognition, which takes place on the basis of shape and chemical complementarity. So this is a collaboration with Massa, shown here. Um, and she's an experimentalist who uses, um, who tries to detect these tiny DNA circles. And of course, for that, the, the bioinformatics is, is really challenging because a lot of these things are repetitive, come from repetitive DNA sequences. So this is where the experimental data comes from. This is our supercomputer at Leeds. So these type of um, computations these molecular dynamics, all atom simulations, they're extremely computationally expensive. So they need big supercomputers. Um, and this is my little supercomputer at Leeds, but it's my favorite one. So that's why I've got a photo of it. So what we're sort of doing is um, explained by this picture here, which is Frankenstein. So of course, what happens in Frankenstein is you take the corpse, it's, it's dead, and then you add electricity and then suddenly the thing moves. And that's what we're doing really with molecular dynamic simulations because most of the experimental data that we have access to is all of static structures. And what we want to do is we want to put the dynamics in. And the um, state of the art of the field 
for atomistic molecular dynamics is, um, it's not me who said this, it's a very famous paper um, cited down here, describe these sorts of calculations as a computational microscope. This idea that the calculations are sufficiently robust and sophisticated that um, it is as if we had a microscope that enabled us to look at our molecules at the atomic and molecular level and the way that they're, mo they're moving. And by saying a computational microscope, let's bear in mind that, of course, there are artifacts in our calculations. There are things, you know, our system sizes are too small, our simulation time shells are too short, our force fields aren't perfect. But at the same time, actually, no experimental technique is perfect either. Everyone, ha every single experimental tool, every single biophysical tool has limits on resolution, noise, system sizes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we think of this, we think of simulation as another biophysical tool that we can use to understand biological systems, hopefully at all length scales. So here are some of our MD simulations of circular DNA. So this one's a, a 90 base pair one, and this one's a relaxed DNA circle. So what I do is I, is I take a linear strand and I join the two ends together to make a circle. And then this simulation, the thing wobbles around due to thermal fluctuations. Just to give you an idea, this on the right hand side, here's the circle surrounded by water molecules and, and counter ions. So this is what the simulation really looks like, but I'm just showing the DNA so that you can, otherwise it's impossible to see what's going on. Okay, so now I've simulated, here's an overwound DNA circle. So what I've done here is I've taken the circle and I've joined the two ends together, but before I join the two ends together, I twist it one whole turn before ligating in the computer. And let's now watch what happens. So this system is under torsional stress because it's been supercoiled. So it's going to undergo a buckle instability and become a figure of eight. There we go. So what we can also do is um, we can pretend that we're the DNA relaxing enzyme topoisomerase one. So the importance of this sort of super helical stress um, is, is emphasized by the fact that prokaryotes and eukaryotes alike all have an ensemble of molecular machines responsible for controlling the levels of supercoiling. And topoisomerase one controls supercoiling by making a nick in one of the DNA strands. And I can mimic that here. So once I make a nick in, one, in the, one of the DNA strands, the DNA is free to rotate so it can remove torsional stress and it will um, relax back to, its, to an open conformation because um, it's got free rotation about that point. So these are the sorts of simulations that, that, that we want to do. So um, we've done quite a few of these over the years. So just to give a sort of whistle-stop tour of the types of things that we found. So this simulation on the right-hand side that I'm gonna show you in a minute, top right, has got like a red triangle in the corner. And that red triangle is for caution because that means that this simulation has been run using an approximate implicit solvent model. And these approximate implicit solvent models have been very useful for studying the shapes of supercoiled DNA because um, in the absence of solvent friction, the exploration of conformational space is far more rapid, um, as you will see. So these are anything with a red triangle is an approximate implicit solvent simulation. So if I play this one, then um, what I've done here is I've designed a sequence so that it has two flexible regions alternating CGCG opposite another flexible region and then two stiff regions, which are GGGGGGGGG in the center. And when I raise and lower the salt concentration, then that changes the propensity of the DNA to compact 
because in low salt, of course, the negatively charged backbone repels itself and the DNA likes to be open. And in high salt, then those charges are screened. So the DNA likes to convert its twist into rise to remove its super, to lessen its superhelical stress and form derived structure. And what we see in this simulation is that when we go from high salt to low salt and repeat the in silico experiment, we find that the same sequence always ends up at the elbows, at the plectinemes of the supercoil, because that's the most flexible region. So this shows you that actually the chemical code of DNA can program where the DNA likes to have the ends of its plectinemes. So the DNA can have sequence dependent structure when it's got complex topologies as well as proteins. The other thing to notice is when we take our DNA and we untwist it. So if you imagine taking your DNA and underwinding it, what you're doing is you're um, pulling apart the base stacking interactions and the base stacking interactions in DNA. So the between the, the um, van der Waals clouds on um, bases in the same strand, these are actually really critical in maintaining the structure of the DNA double helix in addition to the hydrogen bonds. So if we negatively supercoil our DNA, then that generates what we call holes or denaturation bubbles. And I'm gonna show you one of those forming now. So this is an underwound piece of DNA. We run the simulation. It's under negative superhelical stress. It's a bit upset and it has a breakdown. So you can see here that we get these holes forming in the DNA. Now, of course, this is very interesting, right? Because it means if you negatively supercoil DNA, you can open up things that look a bit like transcription bubbles. And these holes in the DNA, you can imagine that they can be targets for um, DNA binding proteins that might interact with DNA. And of course, it also massively changes the overall shape and structure of the duplex. So um, some, some biological implications are that, you know, when the genome folds, the um, sequence could potentially play a role in where things like to form plectinemes and where those plectinemes sit with more flexible regions pretending to be, preferring to be at the ends of plectinemes rather than in the center and also topology dependent recognition or transcription. So when you change the DNA topology, you're, you're dramatically changing the shape of the DNA and you can imagine that might um, alter its interactions with other molecules. Okay, so we can run these simulations, but are any of them correct? So we were very, very, very lucky to team up with a wonderful, um, series actually of experimental teams so um, this very flamboyant team here um, led by Lynn Ziedrich at Baylor College of Medicine so these are the guys who um, can synthetically make these tiny DNA circles so they can make them in bacteria and they can make circles as small as sort of 300 base pairs all the way up to well, you wouldn't want to make really big ones because um, you could do those more easily using other means. So these are the guys that make circles. And then these guys here, this is Wa. Um, he was at Baylor College of Medicine, but he's just moved to Stanford and he's a cryo-EM genius. So um, Wa's group was able to take Lynn's mini circles and they were able to image them with cryotomography. Now, this was an unbelievably challenging thing to do because these circles are very, very tiny. So real challenge right on the edge of what you can see with cryo-ET. And they're also um, incredibly dynamic and very, very flexible. So, um, so we're looking at a 336 base pair mini circle made by Lynn, imaged by Wa, and this is the sorts of things that you see. So for different topoisomers, you see um, different levels of superhelical stress giving rise to different levels of compaction. So this is the experimental data here. 
and then you see these weird shapes so so because it was the first time they'd ever seen these they went through and classified them by hand and they had different um shapes they had a tennis racket they had handcuffs they had the needle they had all of these opera glasses as well they had and then they just had some that they had no idea what they were so they just called them others um so one of the challenges that that we were given as modelers is do our calculations look anything like the global shapes that you see from cryo-ET? And can the calculations provide any insight into what these weird shapes might be and into why um, even for a given topor isomer, so for a given um, amount of twist in the DNA, we still see all of these diverse structures. So, um, I'll just show you this simulation at the bottom. Notice that this one is, a, is an approximate one. Oops, let's hope it's gonna work. It worked earlier. Do excuse me. Here we go. So this is one of Lynn's mini circles um, adopting a rise confirmation. And from this, we can calculate things like the radius of gyration for given topo isomers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and compare with the experimental data. Now, one of the things that we noticed um, that was important for getting the shapes in, that we see, the overall global shapes that we see in the simulations to look anything like the shapes that they see in the cryo-ET experiment, is that these implicit solvent simulations, because they are approximate, they are run in the presence of hydrogen bond restraints that don't allow the formation of denaturation bubbles. And then what we do is we take these implicit solvent models and we solvate them in real water and we take the hydrogen bond restraints off. And when we do that, what we see is that we get these defects forming and they always form at the tips of the plectoneme, so at the elbows, the apices. And of course, we can only see these denaturation bubbles forming with the more accurate explicitly solvated simulations where we can take the hydrogen bonds off. One of the things that we were able to see, and this with an implicit model, um, for very, very negatively supercooled circles was we were able to see this three, um, so this sort of three-legged structure, and there's a, a defect. These things like to form defects right at the edge of these when they're allowed to. And um, that, of course, looks a little bit like this one here. So we can start to see with the modeling that actually some of these shapes maybe aren't as crazy as they look. So just to show you um, the synergy between the simulations and the experiments. So the experiments are the wireframe and the simulations are the um, molecular structures with the backbone shown in black. You can see a, a negative one. And a different one that we were able to fit. So by until we had the cryo, we didn't have any idea whether our simulations were a good representation of reality or not. But now, of course, we have the cryo that gives us a lot more confidence. Moreover, the cryo, it's wonderful and it's really, really cutting edge. But you can see that the resolution because of the size of the mini circles is, is not absolutely great. And it can sometimes be difficult to interpret the experimental data in terms of what the molecular structure looks like. So when we're able to combine the experiments and the simulations, then we get something where we have a lot more confidence in, in both halves. We, we, we get more from the experiments because we can see what they might represent. And we have more trust in the simulations because we have some experimental validation of, their, of them. 
So then we, we were extremely lucky to have um, another collaboration with another amazing experimentalist. Here she is down the bottom here, Alice Pine. And these were simulations done by Agnes, who was working in our group at the time. And um, what Alice is able to do, actually it's the same DNA mini circles because we got them from them. What Alice is able to do is she's able to do um, AFM experiments that are so precise that she can actually see the major and minor grooves of the DNA. So if we have a look at this picture here, here the red triangles are indicating defects. So this is an AFM image and this is where we see a defect. Here's the AFM image and hopefully you can just see that actually you can, the AFM shows you that there's a defect here where the DNA is separated into two single strands. And so um, the other innovation that Alice was able to make with her AFM experiments is that she was able to um, trace with computationally, so this is illustrated by this picture up here, she was able to co trace computationally all of the DNA circles that she sees in her AFM. And so we were able to get statistical distributions comparing the simulations and the experiments. And that enabled us to get both from experiment and theory, um, a measure for what the maximum bend angle of a piece of DNA can be before it has to break and form these denaturation bubbles. And yeah, so you can start to get some insight into what they sort of look like. They're normally at the edges of plectonemes, these defects. You get more defects, the more negative superhelical density you have. And, and again, the, the simulations and the experiments mimic each other very well. And having another experimental tool to compare with the experiments and the cryo-ET is very powerful because the AFM exper experiments give us better resolution because we can see the major and minor groove and we can actually see the defects in the imaging. With the cryo-ET resolution, you can't do that. You need chemical probes to look for denaturation. And um, the, the other thing is, is that, of course, AFM, the experiments themselves, I mean, it's wonderful, but you do put your molecule on the surface and then smash it with a massive hammer to get a picture. So you, there, are, there are artifacts associated with all of these experimental tools. And when you can use a model in the middle to connect, connect different disparate types of experimental data together, I think that's very powerful. So um, we've also started to obviously look at um, protein DNA interactions in supercoiled systems. So um, we started to look at um, DNA wrapped around nucleosomes um, and um, other and, and sort of um, bacterial proteins such as FIS. One of the things that we have noticed that keeps happening all of the time um, that maybe you wouldn't have thought about without doing the modeling is how protein DNA interactions can be very different in supercoil DNA compared to linear DNA because different because you've got more DNA condensed in one place. So okay so what this is is it's a supercoil DNA mini circle with topoisomerase bound to it. And it's bound in the place where you'd expect the motor to bind and recognize the DNA. So it's got, it's got some sequence selectivity. But of course, what we didn't expect is that when the protein binds, it actually, because of the proximity of the rest of the DNA circle, which is itself caused by the fact that the DNA is supercoiled. If it was linear, there's no chance that, um, that the DNA would, would be anywhere near the protein because of the statistical unlikelihood. Um, it's, it's just not very likely. So here we get additional protein DNA contacts because of the supercoiled nature of the substrate of the DNA. And actually, We've seen this all of the time. We've seen this loads and loads and loads. So we see this as well with, um, 
with other DNA binding proteins and bending proteins. And you start to wonder, you know, about this, um, you, you start to be able to see that if you've got a protein that puts a bend in a particular place that then pre-programs where the rest of the DNA has to go and might potentially enable bridging interactions between distant sites of DNA. We also think that these sort of binding proteins can block supercoil diffusion. So, so the other thing, the other place where supercoiling really matters is during transcription, because of course, when you transcribe DNA, you're pumping supercoils into the molecule that have to be released by topoisomerase one. Otherwise the whole system sort of jams up these dynamic supercoils. And, um, and, and we, we know that, that if you've got proteins bound, they can act as a block to supercoil diffusion. And then um, topoisomerase needs to actually decide where it's going to bind and act um, because if it if it does a nick on the other side of a, a super core blocking protein it's not going to help any remove any of the torsional stress during transcription so protein binding and supercoiling are highly coupled um, and um, completely you can't separate one and the other Okay, so how long have I had, Carl? And do we want to go on to the next bit, or would we like to take questions, or do we? What do you want to do? Yeah, you've done very well. We're about just gone half past, so oh, okay, time left. But um, happy to take some questions on the first half if uh, if anyone has has them. Chris, um, I, I'd be quite interested to know how you're parameterizing some of the terms in that. Um, energy function that you uh, introduced to be, uh, at the beginning. Um, okay. Particularly some of the, you know, uh, bending and twisting terms that aren't quite so, uh, you know, immediately translatable to uh, something measurable, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it's, it's so, so for atomistic molecular dynamic simulations, the construction of this force field is absolutely key. So um, the community have been working on perfecting force fields for proteins as well for um, far longer than I've been using them, maybe 25 years. So, so the... the um, Stretching and bending parameters um, for bonds are generally obtained either from spectroscopy or from quantum mechanical calculations on tractable fragments. Um, the same with the dihedral parameters, so rotating around a bond, and those ones are quite difficult. So, um, e e you know, and, and, and what we find as well is that if you change one, um, you know, you change one of these dihedral parameters, you change everything. So for years and years and years, we had a nightmare with our dihedral parameters in which our DNA was under twisted by two degrees. And that didn't matter to the linear modelers, but to me, it's a nightmare, right? Because it makes my superhelical density wrong. So, so these force fields have been so. So you are. So my answer is, quantum mechanics on small tractable fragments, experimental data, witchcraft, and persistence. Right, but this is so. This is something that it is fully atomistic. Then, and you're yeah. right. You are looking at individual bonds between atoms rather than coarse graining over domains. Yeah. These yeah, okay. ones are totally atomistic. So, of course, the implicit ones are sort of a bit coarse grain because there's no water. Um, but yeah, these are totally atomistic. So that's why they're so expensive. Yeah. Are, are you developing your own software for that, or is is it um, something no, off the shelf? So, no, absolutely not. So, so, um, so our the molecular dynamics codes. Actually, none of them are developed in the UK, which is a bit of a shame, um, but they are extremely sophisticated in terms of, you know, parallelization, running on GPU, optimization on different supercomputer systems. So NVIDIA help out with 
parameterizing them because so and, and optimizing them because so many people use them. <clears throat> so that's one advantage. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we, we also have a couple other questions. Um, Norman, would you like to go next? Sarah, you may be about to go on to this. I'm from the proton beam therapy um, group and we're very interested in what happens when DNA breaks. Oh. Um, and um, the, the nature of damage to DNA between photon conventional radiotherapy and protons is very different. Um, the damage with protons is much more clustered. Um, and I'm wondering whether you have um, ever attempted to simulate the uncoiling and or the diffusion of the broken ends when um, these DNA strand breaks occur, um, either two single strand breaks on opposite strands in, in the neighborhood of each other or a complete um, sort of proton double strand break. No, we haven't, but it would be a really interesting thing to do. Um, and and it does it does make you think as well about if you've got linear DNA or supercoiled DNA. Your supercoiled DNA was probably likely to be a lot more compact. So you'd imagine that maybe that um, has a very different pattern of damage. Yeah, and and also um, of, of course the DNA, the correct repair of DNA double strand breaks depends on how fast these ends fly apart, because they um, fairly rapidly can get so far apart within the nucleus that the proteins that have to bring them back together again can't reach them, and you start getting misrepairs and all sorts of things. I, I could go on for hours. What you're saying is immensely interesting. Um, we, I think we should pass on to at least one more question, Carl. <laughs> Great, thanks. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, Andrew? Uh, thank you. I was wondering how you knew the degree of supercoiling um, in your experimental cryo ET structures. How they, how they put the supercoiling in? Um, well, either how they synthesize or how for each structure. How do you know the delta LK value for each one of those structures? Okay, so um, they are made so you can make them with increasing amounts of intercalator in the in the DNA and then um, the more intercalator the more underwind, underwound it will be and then you wash the intercalator out and then you separate them um, with gel electrophoresis. Okay so you do yeah. know exactly right thanks. They're very clever the biologists. <laughs> <laughs> thanks uh yeah that's great thanks for those questions um okay so we're on 22 now so i have left you slightly less time now to do that's your, fine uh, i'll questions. so I'll, what i'll do with this bit is i'll i'll sort of give an overview of this bit and then if people are really really interested um then of course you know i'm i'm around i'm i'm always in front of my computer so just drop me an email and we can um, um we could chat further so great. so um of course, these DNA circles are lovely and, and, and I've really enjoyed them, but, but biology is big and it's complicated. And there are actually 10 to the 14 atoms in a eukaryotic cell. So we're not going to be able to get an atomistic picture of everything. Um, and we're not going to be able to use, there's not a, a computer powerful enough in, in imagination that would be able to do the, the speeds of sums that we need. So we need more powerful equations, more powerful computers won't help us. And so I'm, I'm interested in larger things as well and being able to go from the at atomistic and molecular level up to the continuum scale. And so one of the systems I'm very interested in is the axoneme. So um, this is a really nice picture from Hermes of a, a swimming sperm and the machine that's doing the, the swimming is this thing, the axoneme. And the axoneme is the most incredible multi-scale motor. So this is an atomistic simulation, if I can get the movie to work. Um, oops. So yeah, this is an atomistic simulation I ran. I can't get that one to work. So let's, go, let's just try this one. Here we go. So this one's an atomistic simulation. 
Um, and this, but what's important about it is this molecule here is this tiny, tiny, tiny little blob on this larger super macromolecular object. And this is the, this is the molecular motor dynein and dynein is the largest molecular motor. And um, if I tried to simulate this, even without its club, it's called the tail at the bottom, then it would be several, it would be over a million atoms. And that's possible, but you're not going to get very large time scales. And then this object here is just one of these tiny little colored things in the whole of the macromolecular machine. And actually dynein as well. So that's that's axonemal dynein. Cytoplasmic dynein is the motor responsible for carrying all of these bits of cargo up the axoneme when it's constructing it. So dynein is also the construction worker that climbs up the, the ladder and puts all of the um, all of the um, new bricks used to make the axoneme at the top of the structure. So if we're going to deal with these sorts of large objects, we need new types of equations. And what we came up with was this idea of fluctuating finite element analysis. So in fluctuating finite element analysis, proteins are continuum viscoelastic solids. So they've got an elasticity and a viscosity and they experience thermal noise. So they're always changing shape. So the sort of matter you can imagine in your mind's eye is a bit like a lava lamp, but unlike the blobs in a lava lamp, because they have a surface tension and they sort of blobby, but unlike the blobs in a lava lamp, of course, proteins have a very distinctive secondary structure that determines what type of dynamics they execute. And of course, they'll have sticky patches on the outside that will make them stick to other blobs in specific ways. So we need to put that into the, the equations as well. And so, um, Fluctuating finite element analysis is basically finite element analysis stolen from engineering um, and from people like Carl. I presume Carl uses some sort of finite element analysis. Um, so, and that, but what we've done is we've added thermal noise so that we've, so, so normally you go, when you do modeling, you go from the bottom up. So you start with quantum mechanics and you make it bigger. We've done it the other way around. We started from the macroscopic and by adding thermal noise, we've shrunk it down. So this is our sort of equation of motion. It's basically Newton's equations, but in the presence of thermal noise. So our, um, we have in our, in our stress, this is our sort of forces, our stress. We have the divergence of, there's an elasticity term, which is the solid bit, a viscous term, which is the liquid bit, and a thermal noise term, which is the thermal noise. So we end up with these things changing shape. So it's a continuum method. Um, you don't want to be under 10 nanometers because you do that atomistically. You don't want to be over a micron, 500 nanometers to a micron, because then thermal fluctuations are no longer important. And um, you'd be better off using conventional finite element tools, or finite different tools, because of course they're cheaper. Thermal fluctuations are expensive. So um, another movie. I love this movie. It's brilliant. But it's an animation. It's not a simulation. And this is showing the dining molecule walking along its track. Um, it could be building the axoneme. It could be carrying something vital around the cytoskeleton of your cells. So the idea is, can we, can we put, it's great and I love it, um, but can we make it physics-based rather than created by an animator. And one of the ways in which we want to do this is again using experimental data. This again is experimental data from cryo, but this is negative, this is cryo-EM and negative stain-EM. I love negative stain. And so this shows experimentally that same motor walking along its track. But you can see that it's doing something a little bit different to the movie so in the movie it's walking like a person or a duck at least 
but um, when you look at the experimental data, actually the two monomers, so the two legs, sometimes disassociate. And um, so it would be as if you could take off one leg, throw it forwards until it sticks somewhere, and then you wait for your other leg to catch up. So it's not a you know, it's not necessarily a conventional walking mechanism. So my idea, my idea is that we can take these um, these pictures, and we can see with our fluctuating finite element analysis if we can use them to make um, a mechanical model of dining walking. So these simulations are really hard. Um, so because there are there are it's you would imagine wouldn't you you'd imagine that if you've got basically two bits of rubber which is what these these objects are in the computer two bits of rubber with sticky feet and a sticky track it would be easy to get them to walk and it really <laughs> really isn't so okay so this is one of our unsuccessful simulations of dynein walking along um, a microtubule so what the simulation has here are the two dynein legs actually these things are called heads just to be confusing but the two dynein legs they're held together by a, a spring here which represents a, a chemical cross link that the experimentalists put in when they did their um, negative stain EM. And this one likes to bind to the yellow blobs, that's its binding sites, but it, in, it can't pass through the blue, but it doesn't have any attraction to them. And this one runs for a very long time, but basically what we would always find with these simulations is one of the monomers will fall off. And once it's fallen off, it just goes off into oblivion. So we couldn't, we couldn't get it to stay on the track, let alone walk in a straight line. Um, so one of the things that we have been able to solve with this so far is um, we then thought, OK, well, we know that the surface of microtubules often contains chemical modifications that might change the interaction between the microtubule binding site and the track in a non-specific way. So in this simulation, it's, it's exactly the same as the previous one, except now the blue has a non-specific attraction as well as, um, a, um, as well as the yellow blobs in the middle, not these ones here. The yellow blobs in the middle are, are specific binding sites. And now what we see is because there is this mild attraction, not strong enough to make it stick, but just non-specific. The, the, the other dining foot that's not bound will nicely just, it'll just sort of skim across the surface quite happily and explore the surface. Um, it does fall, it can fall off, but it's a lot more likely to find its binding site again. And now actually it does like to sit in these cracks because there's a, the, the, um, the attractive forces, what we call them sticky patches, that we paint on the surface of our continuum objects, they depend on the surface area. So actually these things do, now I've made this slightly attractive, they do like to stick in the cracks. So the thing that we learn from these simulations as we work towards a, a model of the thing walking, eventually one day we'll get there. The thing we learn from these simulations is that the processivity of the motor looks like it needs a weak non-specific potential to keep the motor localized near the track. And um, then we can do things like we can map, map back to atomistic models. So this isn't a real simulation of a dimer. This is our FFEA simulation with the um, atomistic structure superimposed back on. So this is a total cheat here. It looks amazing, but it's completely a cheat because this is a coarse grain model that has been um, had the had the atomistic coordinates superimposed. But of course, then we could, in principle, take this structure and run an atomistic simulation. So we could run coarse grain things and then fit things and then again run them atomistically if we wanted to. So we've also been trying to do some simulations at the kinetical. This is one of my dream um, 
simulations that I'd like to be able to do. I'd like to be able to, if not model cell division, at least model one of these strands here that are attaching to the DNA and pulling it apart. So the Kinetacore is just the most amazing um, machine. It's the machine that attaches the nuclear material to the cytoskeleton during cell division. And what has to happen before this amazing structure here can form, and this is the structure that pulls apart the two chromosomes, is our um, kinetical structure. So this spider-like object has to dock onto the side of the microtubule and then somehow walk round and grab onto the end. So this is something that we've been trying to simulate. So here's, um, it, we've made a little bit of a start. Here are the little feet of our um, kinetical dangling on the surface. So that's like a sort of close up of this simulation. And then if we zoom in, so these are our NDC, ATC legs interacting with our microtubule. And then what we want to do is depolymerize the microtubule because that's what we think happens and then see what happens to the legs as the microtubule disappears and see if our kinetical moves from the lateral attachment to the end on attachment. And what we've done with um, this model is because these, so these things are really, really long. If I remember rightly, there's something like 70 nanometers or something, these NDC ATC legs, like the spider of the kinetical, they're really, really long. So these are modeled um, not with a finite element mesh, but with rods. And we can um, connect these one dimensional rods to the three dimensional globular structures that represent the rest of the protein. What we don't have is sheets. We'd like sheets to do membranes, but we don't have sheets. So of course, what we'd love to be able to do is we'd love to be able to take images from tomography of axonemes, one day of organelles, one day of cells, and we'd like some machine vision to then identify what these things are, grab them from the PDB, and then enable us to automatically generate some sort of mesh to represent large biomolecular 3D objects, and then we could run a simulation. It's a complete dream, but um, I think you need to, you need to be aspirational, otherwise, um, it's not as exciting. Even if you know you'll only do a small part, it's nice to have a, your eye on the bigger picture. So our modeling philosophy really is that we, you know, we like to take the experimental data, analyze it, simulate it, and then repeat this sort of virtuous triangle um, as much as we can. And um, our little, um, this is, you know, our little walrus, that's our, our sort of logo for, for the FFEA software because it's based on, on TETS. And if you're interested in the software, um, I've got to warn you at the moment, it's going through the Python 2 to 3 crisis, but it is available to download from Bitbucket. So, um, Acknowledgement. So um, the DNA topology community are absolutely awesome. Um, obviously, I haven't seen any. I've seen I see them online about once every couple of weeks. Um, I, they're really amazing community. Everybody should come and work on Supercore DNA because everyone's so nice. And um, yeah, these are these are this is our community, basically, um, all of my friends. And um, for the FFEA, um, these, so Stan's the experimentalist, Tomo does the um, Kinetical, Ben, um, Albert, Rob um, ran a load of the simulations and my two mathematical collaborators with, well, without whom I would never survive, are Daniel and Oliver. And Michelle and Steve do a lot of cryo EM, and here's our cryo EM, and here's Molly, who's also doing cryo EM. And thank you very much. Happy to take more questions on either side if I haven't run out of time. Uh, thank, thank you very much. So uh, yeah, I realise some people will may may have to to drop out, but we've still got time for a um, 
few questions if anyone has one. Oh, and a round of applause, of course, which uh, Chris has just Thank you. in the uh, thing. I, I still I still haven't worked out how to do that. <laughs> um, so I, I had a question actually. Uh, I think you touched on it on one of your slides there, but um, uh, and it's obviously something you'll have thought about. But the, the I guess one of the missing or one of the ingredients that's super important is the um, is the ATP um, sort of to ADP. Uh, uh, reaction to power your molecular motors yeah. uh, how, how are you dealing with that in the ffea simulations oh we cheat <laughs> so um so for dynine we know the pre and post power stroke states the shape of them from um cryotomography so when we do a simulation um, what we can do is we can just switch from the pre-power stroke state to the post-power stroke state. And we do that with a certain probability based on the current shape of the molecule, so how light the next state is, mm -hmm. and um, the kinetics. So we can sort of say, oh, you know, we want it to switch every X. Yeah, for like um, some concentration of ATP in the background or something. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the experimentalists will say, um, "Oh well, you know, we know that the motor um, hydrolyzes ATP at this rate, for example." So, I mean, we're nowhere near to um, having a situation in which we really care about the time scales. You know, so we can do this switching. The problem with the switching is the reason it's so difficult is because actually we have a lot of problems with our meshing. Our meshing is dreadful. And um, when we build bad meshes, which we invariably always do, unfortunately, um, because it's a dynamic simulation, any slither elements, any really small elements can invert and they crash the simulation. So if you're doing one of these structural changes where you're putting the system under stress to go from one state to the next, doing that and keeping the simulation stable is challenging. Mm. Oh, we've got a question from Ivo as well, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh Ivo, you're quiet. <laughs> oh, yes, I know. Yeah, I forgot to unmute myself. I, I uh, remember to show myself, but I didn't think of unmuting myself. <laughs> so I have a question um, that is quite general and um, it may not be something that is easy to answer. So um, um, I am working on ion channels and in ion channels, you um, can um, find that quite commonly, the channel seems to switch between quite different levels of activity. And um, these different levels of activity are, um, yeah, related to completely different um, conformational states. And um, I was always wondering if there was a possibility to use um, data that you can um, get from um, patched clump experiments where you detect um, the activity of the channel to, in a way, interpolate between molecular dynamics um, simulations of individual conformational states. So um, I'm not the right person to answer that mm -hmm. because um, there are, so, so actually the UK is very, very famous for um, iron channel simulations because there's a big, the person who invented them, Mark Sampson, um, based in Oxford, he's had a big group for many years and they're really, so, so I, I always feel very nervous talking about membrane proteins because I know that, you know, my, a lot of my friends know a lot more than me. So um, people, re so there's a lot of um, investment gone into understanding these sorts of conformational changes and how they're gated. Um, and differential gating of ion channels. And the, the, the challenge is, is that because they're activated processes, they take place over time scales that are so long yeah. that we can't see them with the atomistic molecular dynamics. And because they're membrane proteins, they're so difficult 
that we can't capture those structural changes with crystallography. So we've sort of been a bit stuck. So people try and drive the systems into different conformers. And, and, and I think um, a lot has been learnt, but there's a long way to go, unfortunately, until we're going to be able to cross the length scales and achieve what, what you'd like, Evo. Mm -hmm. um, but I can see why you want it. And also, I would say that maybe we'll get better at it when we have more experimental data, for example, from cryo, you know, because you can do it's a lot easier to get membrane protein structures now, even high resolution ones in um, polymer discs. And so hopefully, Evo will be able to. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks a lot. We have been trying. We're just <laughs> not there yet. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot.